Borag Thung Earthlets, for those of you who don't know uh, or joining us for the first time, that is Beetlejuicean for hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Bolt Shah. I am the uh, brand manager for 2000 AD, and this is the 2000 AD Thrillcast. Uh, it is a pleasure to be back af after something of a enforced hiatus, so we apologise for that. But we are back with a, a proper schedule with lots of fun things in the future. And not only that, but I am joined by a new colleague um, who uh, was uh, constructed last year and has been uh, doing excellent work as 2080's brand new marketing manager, Steve Morris. Steve, uh, welcome to your well, no, your second um, 2080 thrill cast because I've had you on before for a bit of a, a, a deep dive, didn't I, during the pandemic years? Back when I was a Hume. Uh, before I was upgraded into my new droid status. Yes, I was on during the lockdown uh, to talk about Simping Detective, I think it was. Wow, wow. I mean, uh, that does... I mean, it's only, what, three, four years ago, but um, that does feel like a lifetime ago. Uh, it's, um, yeah. So for yeah. me, it was. I've been re-scrapped, redeveloped, um, upgraded <laughs> slightly. Um, uh, the, the upgrades come every six months you get a new set so mm. i'm on the way but not quite there yet i don't have a designation yet but i'm looking forward to it wonderful wonderful well it i mean it, it's it's been a pleasure to have you have you on board uh, mostly to stop me going mad <laughs> but the um the added bonus is that uh we're able to get the podcast going again because uh, i know it, it, it from messages that people have sent um and and tweets and all sorts of people have been missing it which uh is is very sweet um, if this is your first time with the 2080s for Lacast, I implore you, I beg you to go back and visit some of our backlist of interviews with, uh, well, the creme de la creme of uh, of comics. Uh, everyone from John Wagner, Brian Bolland, uh, Mick McMahon, um, Kevin Neal, uh, of course, who, who, who we lost recently, and um, Alan Grant, who we also lost. Um, we've been going since... 2015 so it's rapidly approaching the 10-year anniversary of, uh, of the 2003 broadcast which is quite upsetting <laughs> I'm perfectly honest with you um but uh yeah um it's 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 a uh, it's wonderful uh to be back and and, and on an even keel um so uh, what we decided was that this episode was going to be a bit more geared uh, towards new listeners, new readers, uh, people who might not be um, uh, long-term Squawk Stick Thargo, uh, which is friend of Tharg, uh, regular reader of 2000 AD. Um, uh, don't worry, if 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 you don't know the um, the Beetlejuice, and uh, you'll soon pick it up fairly easily. Uh, <laughs> I get paid to say it, which is you know great. Um, so uh, we have uh, 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 an episode of two halves. Uh, for you uh, this time, which is the first half is going to be Steve uh, on his on his uh, first time at the helm, uh, interviewing a couple of uh, comics critics, people relatively new to 2080, but but who seem to have picked up the bug um, in the last in the last few years, which has been really fantastic to uh, to see. I mean, uh, Steve, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, about this because um, you know you, you've you've been a comics critic for many years you run the shelf dust site um you've uh, certainly well since you've been at 2080 you've been going through the hachette partworks collection books uh and kind of you know seeing them with fresh eyes um what 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 what's been your experience over the last six months seven or eight months i can't remember when you started <laughs> six months now yeah it's been a manual right. isn't it um, um uh, with 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 not just discovering for you, for yourself, but also you know um, working with press members of the press to 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 get into two thousand AD. What's it been like? Well, for for me, the first thing I wanted to do was was read a lot of the classic stuff and and get it in in my head so I could understand who was who and mm. and what the history of it all was because. Uh, you can look at 2000 and think, oh, that looks really daunting. It's been around for over forty years. There's lots of comics there. Or you can say, right, well, actually. Let's just sit down with them and read these things and see what they're like. So I've been sitting down. I've read uh, most of Rogue Trooper. I've been reading, uh, obviously, Dread, Anderson, uh, ABC Warriors, Slain, just a mix of everything, really. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing is um, revisiting it uh, um, and also talking about it now on social media, going through it by page by page and saying, here's something interesting, or here's something I didn't expect, or here's something I didn't know was true about these characters. And I got a lot of comments from people saying, oh, that sounds interesting. Like, never heard of... Um, 
Zolma before or Ace Trucking Co or who are these characters? So uh, then they just follow up and go, well, actually, you know, they're collected in this book and that book. Off we go, try it and see what you think. And um, if you like it, great. If you don't like it, move on to the next thing. There's something else there. There's so much out there. So um, the two people I've got who I'm talking to today are um, Rachel Belwar, who writes for Comic-Con.com. Um, and I've got Zach Quaintance, who writes for The Beat and used to run a website called Comics Bookcase, who he has uh, recently killed off. Um, and uh, both of them uh, I asked to, to join us because they've both been really engaged with 2000 recently off the back of uh, some of the things I've, I've been talking about, but also just in general. Um, Rachel got in touch with me saying, oh, this character seems interesting. I want to know more about Devon Law. I want to know more about Judge Anderson. What have we got there? Be interesting about it and um uh, zach was similar um saying there are certain characters that he's starting to pick up with uh he's never read the prog but having looked at it and going oh this is actually a really cheap comic you know if i buy it digitally i can just get it you know um, straight to rainbox and uh keep it and read it when i want to um he said where do i start so we pointed out an issue and went from there and they've both been really enjoying it uh from what i can tell you know they've both had uh, particular issues, particular stories, characters that they've really reached out to. So I thought, well, let's let's talk about that because you know every every comics publisher's got a back catalogue of stuff that might seem intimidating, but when you actually sit down and start reading it, it's not it's not a chore. It's not it, it, it's great fun. And uh, 2018 more than a lot of other comics, I think, stands up more now, um, even though these comics were made you know decades ago before I was born. In some cases, um, you look at it and go, but yeah, yeah. Uh, you look at it and you go, well, this is this is something that could be published tomorrow, and it would still feel, you know, uh, interesting, relevant, and really topical in a lot of cases. So, yeah, that, that's kind of what we're looking at today. Oh, it, 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 I think it's really apposite for for um, uh, rebooting the, the 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 podcast because it started back in 2015 when the Judge Fred Mega Collection part works started, and it was intended originally to be a companion to that. And then mm. kind of blossomed into being a regular podcast um so yeah perfect timing i think uh thematically and and date wise and everything um yeah it, it's 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 one of those things i mean you know i've i've been at 2018 now for 13 years um and it's easy even for me to think well everyone knows what that is Everyone's heard of such and such and such and such, you know, it, it, and and you forget that for the vast majority of people, this is the first time they're encountering this stuff, even though it is 30, 40, 45, 47 um, years old. So uh, it, it, for me, it's been refreshing, like I said, to see you see it with fresh eyes. Uh, yeah. and it's kind of reminded me of a, a, a lot of things either I've forgotten or have just kind of, you know, fallen away so uh that, that's very refreshing i mean I, I, the the one of the things that we have revisited um most recently comes on the back of some news which is of course the rogue trooper movie which mm -hmm. um you know grud willing uh will be out next year uh written and directed by jumping jones starring an Aaron barnard um Haley atwell uh sean bean um, Asa Butterfield, uh, if anyone is a fan of uh, Sex Education, the series. Um, a, 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 a Matt Berry, of course, um, has also been announced. So uh, great news. It's wonderful after an enforced many years of silence uh, on that one as people have worked behind the scenes. It's, uh, it's great to see. So, of course, revisiting Rogue Trooper is one of the things that we're going to be doing on the podcast over the coming months, um, not just uh getting people's take on the on the classic comics but talking about what's coming up in the future and also drilling down into the history uh you know the cre creative history of uh, of rogue trooper in a way that um yeah podcast is a perfectly uh is a perfect way to uh to do that so i'm i'm very much looking forward uh to doing that um so uh what we've also got on this episode, because I realised that's what we were talking about a minute ago, um, regular listeners will uh, will notice that the amounts of fluster and uh, and gumph at the beginning of the episodes has not reduced um, with <laughs> with the new spell. Anyway, um, what we've also got coming on this episode is um, uh, with uh, I'm talking to Rob Williams, Arthur Wyatt, and Henry Flint 
about um, A Better World, which is the, the Judge Dredd story that's running at the moment. By the time this episode comes out, I think subscribers will have seen episode seven um, uh, of nine. And uh, I mean, it's great. It's 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 generally fantastic. For those who, who haven't been keeping up with it, um, it's essentially uh, uh, just an, an incredible, incredible kind of melding of Judge Dredd and current events um, in uh, in a way that only Judge Dredd can do, uh, and examining what happens when the the idea of um, defunding the police comes to Mega City One um, under the auspices of Judge Maitland, uh, uh, who's one of the accounting judges. And it's, I mean, setting the story aside for a moment, which is fantastic. Um, I, I, you know, I'm I'm on the edge of my seat. Like when when an issue of 2000 AD goes to press, I'm straight on the server, <laughs> looking at the PDFs, seeing what's thing. happening. Um, uh, just just the artwork alone. I mean, this is career high work from Henry, and and you know, he's he's undoubtedly got a very long and, and prosperous career ahead of him. But it, it's just stunning. It, I mean, it's it, it's it's Ronin. It's you know, it's Miller's Ronin by way of um, you know a, t- a touch of Mobius, um, a little bit of kind of I see a little bit of Colin uh, Colin Wilson in there, just in the kind of rendition of Future Tech. Uh, just absolutely fantastic uh, to watch. The, and of course, the tension that he ratchets up in each issue is 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 incredible because. Yeah. Yeah, you read every new um, instalment, and um, as he as he's doing it, it's not just um, the detail he's putting in there; it's the way that the uh, the story seems to be tightening around every character involved. It's mm-hmm. you know, it really feels like at this point, you know, anything could happen. You know, um, we could see um, uh, Maitland completely change the judge system forever. Um, you know, it it just got this feeling of you know, there's a real sense of this is the future coming into into dread now, and what's that going to mean for everyone involved? You know, it's. It's, it's incredible to see the the way that the art is really pushing that story forwards. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and it's 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 kind of I see it as a as a culmination of of um, particularly Rob Williams's spell on 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 dread, not a culmination, but you know a, a drawing together of, of various threads. Because you, you you had the small house, which is one of our best selling um, dread books for for many years, um, and this. This draws on on um, issues that that go all the way back to Chaos Day in um, twenty twelve. Um, uh, you know, goes all the way back to Tour of Duty and Origins. You know, that questioning of uh, the justice system, the, the 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 rejection of of this rhetoric of the judges that they are the only way. You know that they are the only way that people can be safe. Um, yeah, because yeah. uh, being a Mega City One citizen is a, a pretty dangerous life um <laughs> to be honest um but yeah th- just just on that that tension thing i mean we talk about it in the interview but um the way henry divides up the page and he he, he, he specifically names the 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 influence um that he draws on for for, for this mm. it just it, it's so anxiety making because it's so he's almost he's got such control over his storytelling and and the passing of time so it's almost like there's bits where it's almost like a heartbeat on the page, um, and it's 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 I mean it's a man at the height of his powers. It really is, and 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 it's been a joy to watch. If if um, people listening or watching haven't caught up with a better world, um, we 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 um, uh, we go into it in the interview about what you need to catch, what you would need to catch up on, um, but you can also dive straight into it. Um, the um, it was the first uh, prog of the year. Which was uh, prog twenty three sixty three, but yeah, it it it's uh, do go onto the two thousand eighty app, uh, or or get the back issues through your local comic book store or through our web shop. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. The collected edition should be out uh, beginning of next year, um, but uh, I, I I urge you to dive in as soon as possible because it really is fantastic stuff. I'm ramping up to its um, undoubtedly um, earth shattering conclusion. Um, you know, is is Justice Department going to to fall apart? Is Dread going to go off and become a binman? Um, you know that kind of uh, that kind of thing. So that's wonderful. Anyway, we have talked enough. Um, looking forward to to hearing uh, your chat with Rachel and Zach, and um, you know, then we've got the the chat with uh, Rob, Arthur, and Henry. 
Um, welcome back, Earthlets, to the 2080 Thrillcast. Um, and uh, we shall be back in uh, two weeks' time for an interview with uh, Simon Harrison. For those of you who don't know Simon's work, um, uh, he was he was a mainstay of the uh, of the prog in the 1990s, working on things such as Bradley, um, uh, Strontium Dog, um, Revere. Um, just uh, it, it's one of those artists that that, to, that only 2000 AD could really publish. Um, a, a revolutionary style of artwork, um, incredibly detailed, challenging, um, difficult at times, um, but but always absolutely enthralling. And um, uh, it was a real honour to actually talk to the man and uh, and find out a bit about him. So that'll be in two weeks' time. Two weeks after that, we have uh, an episode where we'll be paying tribute to John Burns, uh, the artist on Nikolai Dante, Judge Dredd, uh, the order and uh, 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 I mean the 60, 60 year career uh, behind him unfortunately and very sadly passed away um, right at the end of last year um so we'll be talking to some of the people who uh, knew and worked and admired uh, uh, yeah a new uh, new John worked with John and admired John um about his his career his work and his impact uh, as an artist and then uh, two weeks after that we're going to be talking to Liam Sharp who uh co-creator of PJ Maybe in Judge Dredd, um, somebody who uh began his career at 2000 AD and has gone on to to huge things in uh, American superhero comics. So um yeah, uh, a, a lovely packed schedule ahead. But uh thank you very much, Steve, and uh welcome to the auspices of the um of the 2000 AD, the chaos of the 2000 AD thrill cast. <laughs> Thank you very uh, much. Pleasure to be here. Good, good. I'm glad. It's not like you're contractually obliged to be here at all. Um, but we shall uh, we shall crack on with our interviews. And um, until next time, Earthlets, uh, Splendig Verthrig, welcome, and we'll see you in a fortnight. All right, fun, Earthlets. Uh, I am Steve Morris. I am the marketing manager at 2000 AD, uh, working alongside Molchar and the other droids at the nerve center of the galaxy. Uh, I'm joined uh, by two Earthlets today uh, who are both uh, renowned comics critics who have been working for uh, several years writing about the industry, um, working for uh, various sites. Uh, I'm going to introduce them both and then we'll ask them to uh, talk about 2000 AD a little bit. Um, Rachel, uh, you're with us first, if we may. Uh, can you give us a bit of a background on uh, where where you've come from and what got you into comics? Uh, what got me into comics is I used to write for... The first website I ever wrote for was That's Not Current. And a lot of the editors were British. And they introduced me to 2000 AD. I'd never heard of it before. And it just the opportunity was, hey, do you want to read this? And I said, yeah, sure. And... That's what brought me into it. And now I write for the website Comic-Con. Um, I do interviews and various reviews, and that's what I'm doing right now. And then on the other side, we have uh, Zach. Uh, Zach, uh, tell us a bit about yourself as well. Uh, yeah, I, I'm i the uh, founder of the now defunct comics blog, uh, Comics Bookcase. Uh, I kind of segued from that a couple of years ago to uh, Helm Up reviews and recommendation coverage uh, for Heidi McDonald's site, The Beat. Uh, my past that, my writing about comics uh, has also um, appeared on NPR. So that's kind of my my full uh, comics resume. Very nice, very nice. Um, uh, and uh, Rachel, as you jump straight in with 2000 AD, uh, let's, go, let's go from there, shall we? Um, so sure. you mentioned that uh, when you joined uh, the site, the first thing they kind of mentioned to you was 2000 AD. Um, before you even opened a, a prog, before you even looked inside, what did you know about 2000 AD? Had you heard of it before? Was it anything that you were aware of? Pretty much nothing. Um, I had heard of Judge Dredd, um, and like a few of the titles, like they were just titles. They could have been anything, so I didn't really know anything about the characters or the progs or how they were released in like in months and weekly magazines. I had no clue about that aspect. I just knew some of the character names, and it just was totally blind area for me so, so when you were you know when you were when you were first offered it um was it something you were thinking 
oh like what's this or or was it something that was like uh something you heard of and you're like this is this is vaguely of interest like was it was it appealing to you when you first started reading or was it um not time? necessarily like because i only like i said i knew the big names but i didn't know of just how diverse the stories are and how many smaller characters there are so like the judge dread stuff is definitely intimidating because i'm also someone who always likes to start at the beginning um so the idea of jumping in or starting at a certain arc and not going back to the very start and even figuring out where the very start is because so many different creators have worked on them um that was definitely um i was nervous about that um actually what made me feel okay with starting was um the first book i ever read was it was a script book and it was basically just a bunch of it went up uh, scripts from various stories so it just was a way of jumping in and getting to meet a different characters and saying oh that sounds interesting i should pursue that and um like i remember one of the first character who really like oh that's somebody i want to read more about is was cadet anderson um she was one who really oh, I want to follow this character and sh sh I like her, so it doesn't matter what story I join, I have that connection. So that was the one that first made me feel, hey, this is something good. But it was that script book, just being able to um, do little s samples of various stories. That's what made me feel, okay, That's a this is a starting on point. And it was okay, like even in the script book, like some of them, it was um, the third part of it it wasn't always beginning at the start but it showed me also that you can jump on and you don't have to even if it's like part four or part five and it just showed me how welcoming 2000 AD is to new readers which like I said I have the very instinct that I have to start at part one but anytime I have just pushed myself to jump in it is very possible and it's not as intimidating as I have it it's just like in my head, no, I can't do that. But it's never been the case in reality. Because, um, Zach, am I right in thinking that you did start with a jump on issue? Is that right? Uh, when I got into the habit of, of reading the prog weekly, which had been something I've been meaning to do for a while, I did do that. Like, I kind of weighed it. Um, so there was a jump on issue with the new Judge Dredd story um, starting. And and before that, what did you know about 2000 AD? Was it something on the radar, particularly you mentioned you've, you, you had a, a vague awareness of it, but was it something you thought, that is something I will jump on with? Or was it something you thought, well, that's maybe at some point, but not right now? Yeah, so it had been sort of something I'd been meaning to do for like years, um, in large part because uh, when I was doing my, my comics blog, I uh, went around to different publishers and like, I was just starting out. I was nobody. I really had nothing to offer them. And I was kind of like, hey, I'm, I'm working on this project. Like, if you send me um, material, like, I'd like to check it out and review it. And 2000 AD was super responsive and, like, put me on their list. So they were one of the first people to actually send me review material. But then what happened was it the weekly pace of it, like, I was just one guy blogging a couple times a week, kind of overwhelmed me. And so I kept in the back of my mind, like, uh, this is a publisher that's really interesting to me. Uh, just their whole uh, the weekly sort of anthology model I always found sort of uh, really engaging and just needed to like carve out uh, a way to make myself uh, jump into it and keep up with it. Yeah, because because that's uh, that's the thing I suppose is there's this um, it's it's quite daunting that it's it's once a week but it's also you know there's there's four or five stories every week there's a lot of different things going on um, as Rachel says you know there's um, any issue that you pick up could be your first issue, but it depends on what, you know, if you're reading the story, which starts off with uh, the first part of a story, the, the final part of a story, the middle part of a story, you could find yourself in the middle of, you know, any different number of um, stories. You could, you could find yourself with any different kinds of characters. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff out there and it's not all kind of like laid out and explained for you. So you've got to jump in with both feet really. Yeah. But I think once you do the, like, there's a lot of things working the way it's structured in the favor of being able to quickly jump in like the the variety of stories really makes that easy to do because like i sort of only needed one or two to get me really looking forward to next week's uh prog like to be, really be engaged with one or two and then um the six page length just makes it such a like you know when you're 
sorting through a lot of comics, the like time element, the buy-in is, is what can be intimidating that way. And the uh, six page increments are very friendly to uh, kind of making it easier to do that. Yeah, Rachel, is that your experience as well with the with the anthology format? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it usually is like I'm following one story every week, and then I'll and that'll get be what makes me consistent about it. But then, because I'm looking at it for this one story, oh, what's that one before? It? And it just you you try things out as they're introduced, and then you just get hooked on different things. And not always every story at once, but that's the beauty of it that you can always find. That one, even if, and usually it's more than one, but that one story that that's going to keep you going, and then you have to read it. You have no choice. Because you said that you heard of uh, Dread. Obviously, he's he's yeah. probably our most famous character, but it was actually Anderson who really hooked you in. What was it about Anderson that was appealing to you? What what uh, drew you in about her stories that being told at the time? Well, I think um, the whole idea of the telepathy and the sto- the kind of stories she was in were always usually tra- tra- traumatic and it was always usually more emotional or at least in my I felt that way that they were more emotional led and often like a lot of stories I've read there's been children involved so it's always that raises the stakes and I just liked it was more about this inner turmoil than there was action to and because she was still a, a judge but it was always more the internal drama going on and the for her what that was like always being able to hear people's thoughts and just that whole the whole premise interested me and as a character I really liked her yeah yeah absolutely yeah um she, she's um it's quite nice when you um you have this understanding that dread is going to be a certain thing then you find out there's other characters in his world and all their stories go off in different directions and they're all different types of story in a way so um if you read dread and you like dread uh, fantastic but also if he's not quite for you there's also these side alleys you can you can venture down and you can find out about you know um low life or you can read uh, the simping detective or you can read anderson or there's all kinds of different characters in that world it's much bigger perhaps than people might realize yeah absolutely and, and, and zach for yourself you said that um uh dread was the story that kind of caught your eye when you first started reading uh was that uh the recent one? Was that poison is that right yeah, poison was the jump on the jump on uh, dread story for me. And how did you? What was your experience reading dread? Was he was he what you thought he was? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest. I probably had a very like my take on dread was. Uh, I was trying to figure this out actually when you invited me to be on this. Like when I first became aware of Judge Dread, and it was it wasn't the movie necessarily when I was a kid, but it was like this the um accompanying video game that came with it for like snes and genesis which uh so like my my impression of um dread was very much based on like kind of a shoddy two-dimensional action platformer for many years (laughs) um and i was like really uh uh i mean it's like just the flexibility i guess of, of um the way the character is able to stay recognizable and be dread and kind of go in so many different directions was really interesting to me right away i didn't realize it was so versatile uh, and then you know um dread maybe is the the the, the hook of, of 2000d but then when you started reading the, the the rest of the prog you started reading future issue was there anything else that kind of caught your eye and, and became like the thing that, you, that you're most excited for each week yeah uh it was the uh Peter Milligan and Rufus Daglow story uh, that launched shortly after I had kind of jumped on. I think it was the second like uh, new story to start after I'd become a, a, a faithful weekly reader. Um, and it, that would really grab me. Um, I mean, I like it not to get too deep into the weeds of what it's about, but it's a, uh, it's kind of a immigration allegory. And like uh, I in a past life was a reporter on the border in Texas and have like covered immigration like and seen these things and that that story really grabbed me just for like how it took this pressing issue that continues to be uh covered in the news and and kind of grows a lot of kind of use uh the sci-fi frame to like to just really make you think and question kind of the human toll it takes and also the rufus diglo art for that story was fantastic so yeah that one was really uh that was uh one i 
I would look forward to a lot and really recommend and enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, that would be the uh, the Devil's Railroad, which has uh, just uh, just concluded recently in the in the prog. Um, I suppose that speaks to something else about 2000D, which is it is not ashamed to be a pretty political comic. Um, it's uh, maybe goes a little bit further or has a bit more edge when it talks about things. Obviously, Dread is quite a well-known satire in general, but the other stories don't shy away from harder topics as well. I mean, uh, is that something that you were expecting when you started reading? Um, no. I mean, I kind of knew that uh, Judge Dredd was was satire for uh, American policing, like was it was always my impression of it. But I did, yeah, I didn't realize just um, I guess how thoughtful uh, it was with it, with the way it approached uh, politics as compared to I think a lot of comics. It can be kind of uh, more reductive about when they kind of tackle politics and less uh, like it's 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 really not afraid to get into the weeds with very specific uh, political issues and ideas, which I think is kind of refreshing. Uh, and Rachel, for yourself, was it uh, similar? I mean, um, Anderson's um, uh, a story which uh, itself doesn't shy away from um, politics. It's not the it's not perhaps the same kind of satire as as Dread is. It's not uh, about um, militarized police as much, but there's still a lot of uh, a, a lot of you know subtle stuff in there. Um, uh, and when you read the um, when you started reading the prog, were there any stories that particularly hit you, or were they were they the political ones perhaps? Well, um, what um, this topic made me think of, I just started catching up on Full Tilt Boogie, and just in the uh, recent story, um, they addressed healthcare, and it's like a story like Judge Dredd. You expect more of the political angle because it's kind of the whole story. Is that not the whole, but. Anyway, um, before to Boogie, it's a futuristic story. It's it's more out there, so you don't expect it as much. But they were just addressing like sh parking prices, and but the healthcare was free, and it just was this little reference in this larger story. But it was it just made it feel more grounded and more relevant. And I just really wasn't expecting it as much there, but it really made it feel more present. Yes, it's the future, but it's covering issues that are present day because it's a new comic and yeah I really think that makes it more interesting and more relatable because some of these stories are out there and that's what makes it connecting it makes it more real world because being an anthology any of the stories could be the one that catches you by surprise and hits a topic that's of interest to you um you know as Zach mentioned you know with his uh, with his past uh, past career, you know, uh, reading the Devil's Railroad suddenly became something that was actually really relevant to him, and that might not have been expected. Um, and and for yourself, you know, uh, reading Full Tilt Boogie, you might think that is a wild traveling sci fi story, you know, um, uh, going from location to location, lots of exciting planets. But actually, it's the the grounded elements that sometimes are the things that hit hardest for us. Yeah, and even just like that, it was something as small as parking, like that would everything going crazy in the story, and finally there's a piece, and then it's parking that throws everything off kilter again, and start, sets off the latest mission in book two, and it's just such a relatable thing, and it's such a minor thing, but it can if you don't have the money for it, it totally can catapult your life, and it just I liked that it was such a small thing, but it showed how it can spin out of control it doesn't matter if it's small it's big if you don't have the money and one thing interesting about world tilt boogie is that it was um originally it came out as part of our regene series which is uh, uh aimed at uh, all readers uh not just uh, older readers um i'm interested in thinking um with some of the stories that you you've been reading uh in the in the prog when they came out have they made you go back at all and pick up collections because full to boogie this is um book two which is out in the prog right now book one is uh, available in trade that's that's around is it the sort of thing now where you go i'm getting my bearings now of 2000 ad i'm picking out the kinds of stories i like and do you find you go back into the back catalog at all a hundred percent uh i always feel like i said I, I always feel uncomfortable jumping in even though it's very possible to do so but i just always feel that need so when book two started it's like yes I need to read book one and um actually the all ages issues are some of my favorites that 2000 AD puts out it 
there because a it's always usually more of a jumping on point and there's something more friendly about that and like i also like finder finder and keeper which is part of that and lowborn high which i think has a collection coming out soon so i'm looking forward to catching up on that but i've been just reading like little snippets and usually that is how i do it sometimes if i don't keep up with the weekly frog oh i know this story now is something that interests me so i will wait for the collections like i know thistle bone was another one that i've been looking at like hey maybe i should go back to the beginning of this because that's I, I overall like folk horror, so I feel like that's one I should pursue next. But um, yeah, that's always the more books, um, collections that come out, the more approachable the characters are. And another one that um, I actually got interested in, thanks to you giving me the opportunity to do an interview. But Rogue Trooper is a character who I had no clue about, and I recently um started. I think it was just for the Christmas prog. There was just the one a one-shot story and it's made and then like i do a lot of googling too it's like to figure out the background for the character but that's one that i now because i read that one what one shot which wasn't intimidating because it was only uh one one frog length story um now that's a character i definitely want to go back and read more of yeah absolutely that was the um the jeffrey wessel and i believe simon colby story that came yes. out for the christmas prog yeah absolutely yeah uh, well, that's an interesting point as well, I think. Um, um, Zach, I'll turn this to you, is with 2000 AD, there is the dreads, but there's also the the other characters who have got a, a bit of a name reputation, perhaps in comics, and you may have heard floating around, you know, uh, Rogue Trooper, Strontium Dog, uh, Durham Red, these sort of characters that have got a bit of understanding, Slain, ABC Warriors. Uh, for yourself, was there, you know, did you, have you heard of any of these characters before you started reading? And, and has reading the prog now get you interested in going back at all and trying any of these yourself um yeah so i i really hadn't uh, aside from dread to be honest i really hadn't heard of any of those other characters aside from um i would hear them in the context of like uh creators whose work i enjoyed in like sort of american comics had worked on zenith or halo jones and things like that so i was familiar with those sort mm -hmm. of characters but it's been um it's been a learning process to kind of familiarize myself with the, these broader characters. Um, and I absolutely am kind of going through the back catalog and buying a, a bunch of, of books. I'm like, I got these new shelves above my desk and I'm like, I want books that look good and I'm buying the essential dread and I'm looking at them right now, but I'm <laughs> buying the essential dread and Anderson books slowly and reading them one at a time and kind of uh, putting them up there. And I've started uh, buying the best of, 2000 AD uh, series of books as well, and and kind of I'm, I'm a sucker for uh, really well done trade dress, so that's kind of what's been driving that. But I'm excited to uh, continue going through those and just kind of broaden my understanding of uh, of the publishing history and the characters and all that. Have you had a chance to to read any of the best of um, volumes yet? Yeah, I've read. Uh, Necro I can't say this word out loud. Necropolis. That... Necropolis. Oh yeah, the essential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um, I have Judgment Day and um, Dread versus Death up there waiting for me. So, so very, very nice. Yeah, I'm in the queue, as they say. A good collection of books there. Um, uh, Rachel, for yourself, have you um tried any of the the, the best of 2000 AD out of interest? Um, you've got a bit more of a, uh, you've you've been reading for a bit longer, so perhaps you knew some of these stories before they came out, but. Well, um, it was because of the first issue of Best of um, got me interested in Halo Jones. So now I've read the uh, first book of that. I don't think I've gotten to the second yet. Um, but I also um, got the first essential George Anderson book, um, Shambhala, I think it is called. Yep. Yep. Um, and so I was reading actually before this, I was like, it's been I, I've had it and it's like it's time I actually read it because it's just on the to do list. And so. Yeah, they are definitely good entry points, and they look really cool too. Arthur Ranson is a a master. I, I mean, uh, getting these um getting the stories back into into like you know large scale print, being able to look at that artwork is just been uh, incredible for for myself. I'm essentially quite new to 2000 AD. Really, I've I've been reading it, but uh, I've not been reading it for a huge amount of time. So. The best of 2000 was where I found out about Halo Jones. I got to read Shambhala, Nemesis the Warlock. So 
that was kind of my stepping point for a lot of these these comics as well. And it's just uh, incredible, I think, to see, you know, you, you may have heard of the name of Arthur Ranson as an artist, or you may have heard of Alan Grant from his work with um, uh, Batman at DC, but to actually see them on their, their home turf in a way and see the stories they're doing within 2018, it is, it is a wealth of stuff to discover there, which is quite exciting, really. Um, I do say that as the marketing manager of 2018. <laughs> um, but still, I, I think the comics are quite good, you know. Um, um, one thing I wanted to ask you both about is um, um, as you're getting into 2018 now, there's um, a, a lot of history with the with the comics. You know, you can read the current Dread stuff and you can read the uh, the essential Dreads, you can read Anderson, you can catch up with these characters. Um, are there particular points that you're looking at now and thinking, I'm realizing there are blind spots or things I really want to do it to, to you know go for next? Um, I think um, Zach, you mentioned um, uh, Zenith. Um, uh, Zenith as, as one perhaps um, are there are there books out there now that you've got in mind you're thinking that's something I need to look into um, no I, I went through all the Zenith books all, all, I got them on a humble bundle and enjoyed uh, enjoyed those very thoroughly it was a really great um, trip I, I, I don't have anything specifically lined up but it, it's it's kind of like the process was with getting myself um organizationally psyched up to read the prog where where in the back of my head it's a it's a lingering concern where i want to uh broaden out i mean there's things like uh battle action that those those kind of large uh, war comics that appeal to me uh that i that i'm meaning to track down at some point and i need to be more proactive about soon and for yourself rachel um are there any characters or books or creators that you're you're looking at trying to follow up with a bit more now uh, one that's always been in the back of my head that, like, from the beginning, just because the art really caught my eye was, I think it's pronounced Flame. Yes. Um, the Irish art. And I remember looking at it, and I always, I've, I've gone through images of it, but I've never actually really jumped in to that series. And that's always been, from the very beginning, the art caught my eye, but I've never actually gone back and checked it out. But that was definitely, that's the first one that comes to mind. I would, I've always wanted to, and for whatever reason, have not checked out yet and is it is the the art that kind of caught your eye on that one first and mm -hmm. then the, the, the character yeah. yeah um there's there's there's, there's a lot out there um uh, like i say i'm still reading through a lot of it myself and catching up on these characters and um i, I read um slaying the horn god for the first time earlier this year and uh just struck by how modern it feels reading it now uh, i mean you, you've seen the you know the the, the artwork the painted work from simon bisley um again it's it's this whole thing you know there's this um there's this chunk of of, of comics that have been out there sat in british shells for a long time uh, uh people in in you know in the uk especially have known about it but seeing slain now reach across and people pick it up from you know uh, overseas and around the world it's it's amazing to see some of these comics have such a uh, such a long life to them in a way they don't feel like reading comics from the 1970s 1980s they feel like comics that are written for today in a lot of cases um which is something that surprised me but is a real pleasure i think you know in, 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 when you read these it's really nice to go these stories are um still relevant still modern still got something to say about them um I think hopefully that's kind of the trick with 2000 AD is, is there's always something that needs to be said. And 2000 AD is not just telling stories for the sake of it. There is a meaning to it. There's a moral behind it or a message or something that wants to be shared. Um, yeah. It's uh it's kind of like catnip to like, if you, for people who are really into comics in that way, this, this like this uh, combination of um, timeless feel and gigantic, back catalog it's like i feel like something where like a fly to the flame with that stuff when you when you're deep into comics and like uh once you start to get into it a little bit like it just makes your brain pop that like oh my god what what else is there here i want to i want to wade through as much of this as i can yeah absolutely that's uh, yeah i think that's exactly it yeah um we are coming up on our time um Farg has only granted us so many minutes to talk um, so uh, thank you both for, for coming on today. Um, um, where can people find you? What are you up to at the moment? Tell us about your current projects and where people can find you online. Um, uh, Rachel, should we start with uh, yourself? 
Uh, well, the main website I write for is Comic Con, where I do various reviews and stuff. I also write about films for Diabolique magazine. Um, I have articles in Cinema of the 80s and Cinema of the 70s magazine, which are kind of self-explanatory by the titles. And I also have a regular column in the Physical Media Advocate, because um, I'm a big Blu-ray collector. That's my other passion and obsession. So I have a column there where I pick a actor every month whose birth whatever the months of the issue whose birthday it is and I look at uh, spotlight some of their films and the ones that haven't come out on Blu-ray yet. But yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. And where can people find you on social channels? Uh, oh, um, yeah. Uh, Twitter is. Well, now more, or X, whatever they want to call it now. Um, and Blue Ski, um, I'm both Figgy Starlog is my handle on both of those. Um, so that's where I am the most. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, uh, Zach, for yourself, um, any projects coming up at the moment? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for asking. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'm actually working on a, a Kickstarter that's currently in pre-launch. It's called uh, Death of Comics Bookcase. Um I mentioned earlier my defunct comics blog. I'm going to dust it off to uh, murder it, essentially, for everyone's entertainment. And I've actually, this uh, journey into the prog the past year or so, um, I'm collaborating with six different artists on the book, and three of them should be pretty familiar, I think, to uh, regular prog readers, working with uh, Anna Redman, Luke Horseman, and, and very thrillingly, PJ Holden drew a seven page story um so that's currently in in pre-launch you can go to uh, death.comicsbookcase.com and be forwarded it to that page and then um past that uh we have a column on the beat every week wednesday comic reviews and um we look at just basically weekly releases from publishers that aren't marvel and dc and at the very bottom of that there is the prog report which i'm writing as i kind of continue to read um the weekly prog and share what I'm liking, what I might not be liking as much uh, in paragraph form every week. Which which has been fantastic, yeah. Um, and and um, uh, people who want to follow you on socials, whereabouts should they go? Sure, yeah. I'm most active on Blue Sky right now. It's just Zach Quaintance, my name. Um, I still have a comics account on Twitter that's mostly promotional, which is a comics bookcase. Those are probably the two best places to keep up with my comic stuff. Brilliant. Well, thank you both very much for coming on to the uh, the podcast today. Hopefully we'll get a talk again in future uh, about more more comics, but really great to have you both on today. Yeah, thanks thank so much. You. you wait a few seconds and then you start talking again. <laughs> right. <laughs> thank Was you that both. good, Steve? Did that go well, you think? Yeah. I thought you were both really, really interesting, to be honest. I, I really enjoyed hearing from you both. Um, I'm really upset that there is a thing in my top corner saying I've got three minutes left of this meeting because I could have I could have talked for a lot longer about all this. I think it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, thank you both for, for coming on and talking about all this stuff um, and, and for giving us a bit of your history with 2000 AD and maybe future history of 2000 AD. We'll see how things uh, go. Um, like I say... Um, uh, this is going to go across to uh, Mike, um, who's going to sort it uh, for us, put it into the uh, the podcast that got on Monday, um, and then we'll um, obviously put it onto our socials, share it on the newsletter, get it out there as much as we can. It's it's, it's a popular podcast, so uh, it should get quite a bit of uh, attention, which would be uh, which would be nice. Um, yeah, I saw the house ads have been running in the Prague the last couple of weeks. Yeah, and it was cool to see. And I really yeah. appreciate you invited inviting me. Same here. I've I've never been on a podcast before, and I felt it showed a little. But uh, I really enjoyed talking uh, to you, and I really appreciate you inviting me. I think I also pronounced blue sky wrong. I said blue ski, so I I always come up with <laughs> pronunciations. So that's great. But you, you, got, to... you, you got slain right, and that's the thing that no one says right. Yes. So <laughs> yeah, because I'm so used yeah. to writing yeah. everything, so it's like oh, now I actually have to say words, and it's like that's new. Um, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no pleasure you uh, came across uh much better talking than i would i did so uh, i appreciate you coming on and talking I, I mean both of you i i picked i asked you both to come on and picked you both because um when you write about 2000 ad there's such a genuine interest in it which has been really nice to to see like you know um i've only come into the job recently and passing on this comic i'm, I'm like what do people actually think of this what's it actually going to be is it actually is it actually what people, people like? Or is there is there appeal in it? And seeing you both kind of go, oh, actually, there's a lot in here that that's kind of appealing to me. It's really heartening and nice. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's 
genuine as well. It's not like you know you're you're you just kind of oh let's just say it's nice to the to the marketing guy. There's like a genuine interest in the way you've written questions, Rachel, or the way that you write about it on yeah. the beat, Zach. So yeah, just that authenticity has been really nice to kind of hear from you both. So hopefully the yeah. blog will continue being good and and continue being something that's interesting to you. One uh one thing I I didn't get to mention I would or maybe we could uh, just for reference to tell you like I think a thing it has working for it is that digital how logistically easy it is to read digitally at a time where all these other ways to read comics digitally have crumbled like that's that was another thing that made it like like I was looking for like a polished easy to read digital comic and the prog kind of like slid right in there you know to like fill that gap so yeah that's a cool thing I think you all have going on as well. Perfect. Thank you for saying that. We'll see if we can sneak that into the episode as well. Uh, this is going to cut off any second now. <laughs> Thank you both for coming in. If it tells you to save this recording, please do and send it on to me. Okay. Um, I will save it from my end and hopefully we'll all be good. But thank you both for coming on. Really nice to talk to you both and have a really nice rest of your day. You, you too. too. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. So uh, Arthur will will join us when Arthur joins us, um, while Henry waves around a, a bottle of tomato ketchup. Lovely. Um, that's that's how this conversation is going to go. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so uh, uh, very nice to welcome uh, back onto the podcast, uh, Rob Williams and Henry Flint, um, because we... I, we're going to talk about a better world, uh, not just um, figuratively, but also literally. Um, the Joe's Dread serial that's been running in 2000 AD for the past few weeks. And uh, the week this goes out, uh, I think subscribers will have just got episode seven. Okay. Uh, FYI, uh, regarding spoilers, um, right. because we, we definitely don't want this to be spoiled. Um, uh, uh, Rob, uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, uh, tell us a bit about the genesis of this story, um, because, I mean, you and I have had conversations about this for a while. Um, and it just there's something about this story that, that that feels really special from the like the first episode. So tell us um, how um, you and Arthur and and also Henry have, have, have brought this to fruition. Um, it's probably a very sort of long winded um, story, really, and w- okay. without that kind of real sort of high concepty like oh we pitched this in one sentence or anything. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a bumbling. We sort of bumbled our way to this uh, over a long period of time. Um, which is, I, I, I think Arthur contacted me a few years ago, and because I'd written a lot of Judge Maitland at that point, even though I think Al, Al Ewing created Judge Maitland, if I if I'm correct, yeah. Um, and Arthur said, look, you know, I want to use Judge Maitland on this story. Do you mind? And I was like, no, of course not. And then we got talking online, and then it ended up us co-writing a story where, where, where you know the first seeds of this were sort of sown which was that basically judge maitland being an accounts judge and being a very kind of driven sort of hyper focused doesn't care about the status quo what's best for the city sort of person um she basically came up with the thoughts of like you know well we're fighting a war on the streets every day of mega city one and it's unsustainable both for the citizens and for the judges so what if we actually, she does a lot of modeling. That's what comics needs more of, right? You know, financial modeling, it's thrill power. Um, she she does, she runs her models and she can kind of see, but if she actually takes money into education as opposed to, um, you know, uh, giving money sort of, you know, for more weaponry for the judges so they can fight this war against the citizens, but actually crime numbers come down and it, and it was, so she then goes through this long, long-winded long journey um, long-winded I shouldn't use that term when I'm pitching stories um, this will be a long-winded story you'll love it um, but she goes through this um, Arthur and I then told a number of stories over a few years one of which was called Carry the Nine um, another one was called The Pitch where basically it was Maitland sort of edging towards this testing ground where she would get given uh, one sector initially of a city um, and be allowed to try out her experiment but the danger is that it works. And so suddenly the fundamental kind of structures of Mega City One and the Justice Department of the judges is like, well, if we're gonna if this works and we do this, we're gonna essentially sort of debalance, you know, everything that is the judge's rule. Um, and some people are gonna 
look at the, you know what Maitland achieves and kind of say, well, this is a good thing, and some people are going to be very threatened by that, and it's going to lead to conflict, which is a very long wind winded way of explaining the story. But um, yeah, well, Bob, Bob, can I ask you a question uh, about like um, what what was the story before this one? Is, is there like an arc? Um, there's a, there's an arc which has been running for a number of years by by Arthur and I. I think that um, the initial one was called um, Carry the Nine, which was kind of Maitland first coming up with this idea. Uh, I think Boo Cook drew that, and then um, then we did a, a one off called The Pitch, um, which was Maitland going in um, to the council. Oh, Arthur's in. Arthur's joining. Yeah. Um, uh, it was Maitland going in before the, the the council to basically sort of make her pitch, um, and 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 Dread sways it. You know, Dread backs her, uh, which is the thing that actually makes the council say, "All right, you can have one sector." Um, but there were a few other stories Arthur and I did, which kind of followed this pattern. One of which was called the Hard Way, which was which was not a a bit more tangential in a way, but certain plot points ran through. But um, yeah, there's a number of stories we've we've kind of been sort of. Sowing the seeds for this, as I said, for for a few years. We're always with the knowledge, I think, but we get to this story eventually. But I think one of the nice things about 2000 AD, it was very similar to when I did the small house, when Henry and I did the small house. That was like the culmination of a number of stories and a number of seeds that have been sown over a long period of time. And then eventually, when you do get to pay them all off, it's it's quite satisfying. Mm -hmm. So we um, uh, hello Arthur, uh, welcome hey. uh, uh, welcome from the other side of the world. Um, I mean, you you mentioned there Dred's vote in favour of of uh, of Maitland's, uh, Maitland's scheme. Um, now, obviously, uh, previously when Dred has looked up from the streets and uh, intervened in the kind of wider politics of of Mega City One, things have not exactly gone well. <laughs> I'm thinking the tour of duty, um, and uh, I mean that's the, the most obvious one um, where he. Um, he demanded the the repeal of the mutant laws and everything that 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 ensued. Um, is is that a, 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 in terms of, of writing something like this? Is that a very easy way to go? Well, you know, um, this is going to have huge consequences. This is going to, uh, you know, we know things are messed up because <laughs> Dredd has voted in favour it over it. Um, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I can't speak for anyone else. I don't. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think Dread backs Maitland in that moment. A because he believes in Maitland. I think he's um, he's a much older Dread now. He's kind of like he's. You know, I think we all get sort of ground down over time. This is where we all start weeping on the podcast. Um, <laughs> but um, I think Dread has kind of fought a war every single day. You know, on the streets, and I think you know, even in his own sort of glacial kind of way i think he sort of kind of goes well she might have a point here maybe there is a better system than this which is kind of a big deal but in, in dreads in you know for dread to you know i don't think dread as we've said before i think is he's not the biggest deepest thinker in the world you know what i mean he's very much on his gut um and also i think there is also a general thing even in, in this story now we can see like he's not 100 percent sure i think when he rides into maitland sector he he has we we have his internal monologue and he's he has doubts. He's like, is this what we're doing here? Are we breaking the law? He asks. Mm. So, yes. Mm. And, and, and Arthur, um, we've 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 heard about this process from Rob's side. Um, what, what about yourself? When 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 did the uh, the the kind of idea for a better world kind of really begin to crystallise for you? I mean, it's as Rob's probably been saying. It's it's kind of the culmination of this storyline we've been having going for a while. Um, I think way back in before end of days at any rate we were talking about doing something together with Maitland and this came together as a thing she could do as a response to a disaster to have this sort of thought of what if we be rebuilt in a different way if what if you know in the uh aftermath of one of these periodic tearing downs of Mega City One, instead of just building up the same old thing, we tried something different. And Maitland being Maitland, she's methodical, she believes in mathematics and models, she models it out, out and makes this discovery that something works. Um, and I think uh, I think that it would be sort of like a, a sort of 
a refunding of education and other services rather than directing things into uh into the judges was um rob's suggestion i think um and it kind of matched the uh the sort of uh some of the defund stuff that was going on at the time um but that was really the seed of it um and that storyline we've been kind of bubbling that along we've come together i guess you know yeah, three or four times now on on Maitland stories. Um, usually, it's been some other story with this sort of plodding along in the background. So, um, the hard way is is basically a sort of a, a a dread versus a team of assassins story, where um, another character that the that Maitland's been bashing up against tries to assassinate her and ends up taking out um, Atlantis in the entire process. Um, there's also uh, a story with Dread going off into space and, and fighting aliens that kind of touches on this one as well. So, you know, it hasn't really all been sort of exciting accountancy action, but uh, it's it's all kind of contributed it to it. This one, uh, though, you know, we couldn't really... We couldn't really tell this story while telling another story. This one is where we, we went all in on, on, on bringing this one to the the head and i i think yeah i think it's very much influenced by you know um a lot of thoughts about how judge dread works about how judge dread you know maybe wouldn't work and also watching things in the real world watching people change things in the real world watching how people oppose change in the real world so there's yeah, a whole stupid but that's one thing I noticed about it. Actually, there's a lot of reflections on real world activities, things that are going on now in politics and uh, just society, uh, the social aspect of the world. So, yeah. so that's good. a lot of those elements being put into it as well. You but kind of, yeah. you kind of want to have a, which is one of the difficult things about it, actually, is you want to have those reflections, but you don't want to be so heavily on the nose when it becomes a polemic, because that's usually quite boring. Um, so it's kind of, you, 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 you're you kind of walking a tightrope with it. Because, with, with, you know, I think we wanted to do that. We wanted it to reflect what's going on in the world right now in a lot of scary ways. Um, but we also didn't want it to be a, this is bad and this is good. I mean, I think there's a lot of the dialogue, even like the two, I thought it's interesting the scene with the two judges when the riot's going on and they're kind of sort of going, well, one of them goes, well, you know, what about, shouldn't we back the side that's backing us, basically? And they, I think there's just, there's, there's, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing is going on throughout? And I think there's no necessarily, necessarily easy answer of them, apart from maybe the fact that everything that Maitland does and sort of, you know, all her models show the fact that the life of the citizens is improving. You know, that's mm. the fundamental fact you can't get away from in the story. So, but, but then I think everyone else in, in, in throughout Dread's world is kind of looking at themselves and going, oh my God, what, what do we do now? You know, which is um, quite a delicious little precipice to put them on. I do really like that, that, that moment when, when the judge kind of goes, well, shouldn't we be backing our side? And and the guy goes, no 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 we must abide by the law but let's do it slowly yeah, and it, yeah. it, anything that challenges that that because uh, it, it's it's the thing that always gets trotted out well the judges are, are, are harsh but fair you know they 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 only apply uh, abide by the law it's like well not really <laughs> well it's also it shows I mean I love that scene because it shows there's a, and and then a bunch of other times there's a schism in like in the judge in justice department between the judges some. You know, like they're human beings. Like you know, some yeah. some kind of go well are going to be a lot more hardline than others, and sort of you know, and some are going to feel betrayed by this. So it does cause a lot of resentment towards Maitland because, understandably, if you're a street judge and you're going out there every day and you're fighting with all the scary things that can kill you stone dead in Mega City One, and someone another one of your number kind of goes, well, let's give you less funding to fight your battles on the street when you've seen your friends. Eaten by land sharks, let's let's say it's always a good one to go to. Um, you know what I mean? It's just um, so it's yeah. For a, it's not necessarily a lot of easy answers, I think, which hopefully keeps it an interesting uh, an interesting story. I, I, how how do you balance 
that aspect of you know we 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 know what you're referring to. We know the the politics and and the the real world events that you're you're, you're leaning into. How as a writer, uh, well, how as writers, um, do do you balance that? Is it a case of 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 drafting and redrafting and drafting and, and, and until you get it right, or is it something that that uh, feels intuitive? Um. I mean, I don't know. I mean, a lot of stuff we throw together very quickly and then and then refine. I mean, that that tends to have been the process on this whole thing throughout. Um, on this one, uh, especially um, for the first time on this, instead of sort of trading off scripts regularly, pretty much every script we we co wrote. So um, there isn't like a single episode that's like purely mine or, or purely Rob's in this one. Um, I think in terms of sort of getting the, the sort of elements right and the, the balance right, I don't know. I mean, you can go very big in Dread. You can go very big in Dread and make it work. So I don't think we've sort of acted like there is a, a limit on that. Um, the setting is extremely tolerant of putting in, like we have a, a character in there who's essentially an angry YouTuber uh, and that guy slots right in. Uh, and then there's actually angry YouTubers out there in the world uh, denouncing this story, which is sort what of a nice kind of funny? symmetry. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of, yeah, I mean, that another thing, just, I mean, uh, just talking about the co-writing side of things, it's partly helpful, perhaps, that I've got a terrible memory these days, but I've been reading episodes and I genuinely can't remember bits of who wrote what. And I, I think that's a good sign when you're co-writing, actually, because if you kind of go, oh, that's definitely me, or sounds like me, or sound, that bit sounds like Arthur. Um, then we, you, you can probably see the join. So, um, but yeah, it's just it's a lot of it is just quite organic. And Arthur and I just kind of we look through, we break the beats together. We broke the, the beats together of the story, and then every episode we go, well, I think you know, we pretty much need page one, two needs to be this, page three, four needs to be this, and it's just which which bits do you fancy writing? And then we, well, kind I of, can't tell. I, we flip, we flip them back and forth, you know. But there's the absurd, the absurd humour that's in there at times as well. I think is really helpful because it that undercuts and stops it being sort of you know preachy. Hopefully, because it is at the end of the day, Mega City One, which is batshit crazy, and there is a fair bit of you know. Yeah, I mean, we have a a dramatic moment, which is a a sort of a vigil going wrong and escalating into a, a big riot and it's okay, yeah in a way a big tragedy on the other hand i think someone throws a dead cat so <laughs> yeah and i like the little i i i forget which one of us wrote it so but i like the the captions here when he goes the counter protest arrives and then the next one is the cat the counter counter protest and then i think a very mega city one thing is the next one is finally the counter 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 protest it's just like <laughs> yeah that feels like drive to me, anyway. Yeah, uh, it's it's also that sort of like headlines thing, but one step beyond thing as well, because you know, um, that's one of the things that that's been happening in the news uh, the, over here. In uh, I'm I'm based in the U.S. in the, the Northwest, so I, I keep an eye on what's going on in uh, in um, Portland, for instance, a lot. And there, um, there's been a lot of protests. There's a lot of counter protests, and then there's been a lot of sort of police responses to protests and counter protests, and yeah, I guess the uh, the the one side being sort of slightly more favoured that is definitely a, a thing that gets observed in Portland. So um, there's not a counter 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 protest there that I know of, though. So we do take it yes. that one step beyond. Yeah. But um, but I think as well, sort of, and then we should also say that the one of the wonderful things which I think elevates this just enormously is we could have written exactly the same script and uh, and a far more kind of how do you want to put it, sort of st sort of stable art style would have kind of probably probably sort of screamed that we were being a bit preachy. But I do think that, like amongst many things that Henry's done with this, that Henry's elevated art style just just absolutely frees, really sort of gives us so much room to play with, with you know, because it always seems a bit, you know, a beautifully Mega City One and that hyper, you know, sort of that hyper sort of sense of reality 
that are there, which again gives us just an element of distance, I think. So um uh yeah, so you know, Henry deserves um an enormous yeah. amount of praise for what he's done with this book. Um, it is, this, this is, I, mm. I wanted to turn to Henry to, to ask about this because something but that both you and, and Arthur have identified is is there's uh, there is action in this strip, but there's also there's a lot of talking. There's an awful lot of internal monologue, particularly from from Maitland and Dread. Um, and at, at, at its heart, it's a fairly dry subject. You know the, the 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 rebalancing of city budgets to promote education over law enforcement. Ooh, um, real power. Oh yeah, absolutely. But uh, what what has struck me, Henry, is 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 how um, the, the the way that you're breaking up your frames, your page layouts, um, uh, just the style itself. The whole thing seems to hum with this really kind of sharp, anxious tension. To the whole thing we know that things are coming to a head and it's going to be really bad just from the art alone I mean, t t tell us a little bit about how, how you've approached um robin and arthur's script on this uh I, I think when i got the script um it, it was it was obviously it was um uh, kind of dialogue heavy there was a lot of uh, things going on with the chatting and everything I, I i initially thought i think matt said that something about it was being um had had a lot to do with town planning and and, and I thought I didn't really know how to tackle it but yeah. I, I I kind of like when 2000 was first created it it had like was breaking down pages into very short um uh, amounts of panels and I think that was reflected off uh, American comics at the time and that was more sort of action and sort of getting the art in there but uh, I, I think uh, by putting more panels in, because I think comics in the UK before that was was kind of fourteen, and I, and I never really liked that packed thing. But having the the dialogue, the speech balloons, uh, it, it it kind of was speaking to me the script because it actually was trying to say that. Um, uh, every bloom was important that there seemed to be like uh, I wanted to to draw a reaction to every thing that was said because uh you know if you put like four balloons in one panel you don't you don't necessarily get the reaction of a particular balloon because it's all important you know so so the uh, the, the face can change throughout like four people talking so, so, so it was. It was an idea to get a snapshot of, of a facial expression, you know, four times in a row, you know, kind of like breaking it up. But also, I was, I, I was kind of influenced by um, a lot of other things. There, there was. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. This this comic back in 1955. Uh, it, it was uh, a YouTube documentary that was just come out in um uh, a couple of, a year or so ago and um oh was that the master race uh that's Christian? the master race yeah uh, uh, uh what, what was his name again uh, uh I think bunny Prigs. uh it'll come to me i was going to write it down actually <laughs> but but he had a big influence on frank miller and uh on ronan and um Dark Knight Returns, and uh, uh, he was the first person to sort of break up the panels and sort of break up the words, cut them out, scalp them all in different uh, areas and sort of just make the whole thing sort of um, get time uh, in order rather than sort of panels where time didn't really seem important. So it was, it was a matter of getting the timing uh, but but I mean I've been interested in that for a long time, but I hadn't had a script where I could sort of put that into practice. So 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 getting your script, it was like, okay, well let's see what I can do with this. <laughs> wow, <laughs> we we really lucked out there because it's, yeah. it's worked out amazing. Uh, I, I just uh, I just um, uh, Google it, but Bernie Krigstein. Ah, because uh, he was so um, uh, he. he 
uh, disillusioned with what um, uh, after that he thought he was going to change comics, but after that he went to work for Marvel. I think he um, Stanley gave him some uh, bad decisions on his story work, gave him some advice which he didn't want to take, <laughs> and he just left and um, became an art teacher. So so he, he kind of was, was sort of lost into. Uh, from the comic world, which is a real big shame, really. But um, yeah, yeah. I think that art style, though, it, what it, what Henry's done is, which is so perfect for our, our this story in particular, is is about sort of like, <coughs> like you said, Mike. Just sort of it creates this feeling of re repetitive stress, basically, and it builds. You know, every page, as the city is, the city feels over crammed with. People, human beings in too small a space and that's pretty much what this feels like and you know like there's going to be a pressure release at some point and the, the way the story builds which you know with, with sort of the, the riots start increasing in size and you can you know you know that it's it's building it's building it's building and there you know there's a claustrophobic atmosphere in the script as well and yeah. um, yes and so uh, yeah so henry's it's one of these like absolutely perfect matches for mm. Henry making that choice, which is to entirely Henry's choice. It's not as if he said, "Do you?" I think Henry, you, if I remember right, you said, so, "Do you mind if I try it?" We we were all like, "Yeah." Um, <laughs> Do we mind? <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, the, the people coming in, and it was like, "Well, he, you've obviously been a lunatic here and given yourself far more work than you needed to do." Well, yeah, it has been a bit, yeah. <laughs> but God, you know, God bless you for doing it because I think we've ended up with something quite unique. Yeah, I mean, normally if I if I'm pushing up to like on a script like nine panels and like, oh, I'm being a bit naughty here, I'm I'm being all Alan Moore. Someone's going to push back on this. And see, then, see, uh, I, I, I'm nine panels, but I don't want like three or four people talking at the same time within hmm. those nine panels. You know, so just just one balloon per panel. That that's that's all I want. <laughs> but but yeah, also I mean, I, Henry's Henry's coloured himself as well on this as well. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like it's it's kind of pure undiluted. You giving yourself a nervous breakdown while you while you while, while you yeah. create this I mean, it, thing. It probably should be emphasised that you know the breakdown of the script, the splitting up of panels. That's all Henry's work as well. That's like a basically a, a storytelling decision in itself, and yeah. um, you know. I think it's been like note perfect every time. Um, like there, there's not any aspect of it where I'm thinking, "Oh, wow, that's a really odd spot to put a split." It's all really naturalistic and flowing really well. So, um, I, which is a different aspect of, I guess, comic storytelling from the sort of straightforward just drawing the panels. But that aspect is is bang on and no perfect as well. I think that's worth worth mentioning. Well, I think that comes from the script. Really super impressed. I love the way this comic looks. You were always oh, so we, improved on that. Uh, we we lost you there, Arthur. <laughs> I was gonna say, I mean, it it does come from the script, but like the 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 um. I, I guess like it's like jazz. We've kind of provided some sort of rough beats and you've done this kind of mm. incredible syncopated improvisation on top of that. I, I, I like that metaphor. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> there is, I mean, we can't give any kind of, there's no story, <laughs> but I do think. Jazz mags. What, 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 what's, it, what's interesting is I think after a, beat like when the pages started coming in me and Arthur kind of when we were still writing it we kind of went oh okay and then we started sort of leaning into this and there is one big storytelling choice that occurs which is entirely as a reaction to Henry's style and, and I think it's um so what yeah well, I guess what was good about it is after and I after, when we saw what Henry was doing then we started leaning into it and we started playing off that so you end up with some interesting choices. I can't without any spoilers. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think when we started writing with this in mind. I think it was fairly early on. I think we saw episode one. Uh, I don't know. It would be uh, early, early like September last year, something like that. 
But it's also, I mean, you can't give writers, you can't say to writers, oh, you can have 14 panels now, because writers go, can we? Uh, hey, and you start getting... I mean, <laughs> the, the, the thing is, is Bad habits, I, mean, I think, I think we, we still turned in scripts that were like six panels, but these were now like sort of six seed panels that may grow into something else. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, uh, you're only doing, producing uh, one script every time I, I'd... Um, so so I, it, it wasn't like the entire amount of scripts came in all in one go. So I was getting the script sort of um, uh, after I finished the last one, not knowing what, how the story was going to turn out. You know, I had no idea. So, and then the script, you started introducing other elements into that uh, script later on, you, you know, your, your own ideas about how to break down the panels and things. So um, uh, yeah, that, that, mm -hmm. was, that was really quite interesting because you, you'd sort of gotten into the idea of, oh yeah, let's, let's see what happens if we do this and tell it this way, you know, w which I thought, oh great, you know, it's caught on. Like a disease. <laughs> all, all comics will be made like this in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think all comics were made like this, but uh, I, I, certainly in the eighties, there seemed to be a huge uh, thing for for this. It was called adult comics at the time, but it, it, it wasn't necessary for adults. It was for kids as well and children. But like, it just uh, had a certain amount of. Um, intelligence just just to sort of read them you know like watchmen dark knight things like that but like in the 90s i just got sort of lost in a kind of merge of big guns and big muscly guys you know this is it. So, everyone everyone kind of talks about the marvel method you know the, the 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 um somebody writes a rough breakdown of what happens they give it to the artist and the artist does their thing and then it comes back and they fill in the dialogue and and i I feel like what what you three have achieved with this story um, is is a far better way of doing it. In in that you, you you're all doing what the things that you want to do, but you're learning from each other. You're you're riffing off each other through that process. So it's not that one of you uh, or one one set of you has finished and then it's handed over to the other. It's the the, the, the you're complementing each other. I mean, I, I I know that you know it blows some people's minds that. Uh, Henry is making artistic choices with episode one, not, know <laughs> not knowing what's well, going to come at the end of it, you know? Well, I should say that, like I say, if anyone else went, oh, this, the only reason this works mm. is frankly because of Henry, mm. because Henry is embarrassing mm. you, Henry, but yeah, you are, you are a bit <laughs> of a savant when it comes to storytelling choices. <laughs> basically, when you work with, like, this is where I sound old and crusty, but I've worked with billions of artists over the years, right, in my career. And um, it's it's kind of like that you, very often you you get a letter in proof. You know, you the, the, the story is drawn and it comes back and then you, you will get a chance as a writer to go through and amend your, your uh, dialogue to fit the art. And sometimes if the artist has is not, let's say, the best storyteller in the world. You have to do a lot of amending to try and sort of make it clear, right? Henry, most of Henry's, when we've worked together a bunch of times, and the, 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 usually the only time I see the, the finished comic is when it's in the shops, when it's in the prog, and there's not once do I ever go, you know, well, that makes no sense, because what's been drawn and what's been written are at odds with each other, and that happens a lot in comics, trust me, it's just a huge amount. So I think taking this really really ambitious uh, approach which henry has the only reason it works is because henry is like a rock solid visual storyteller above all else there's a, a, other things going on like design work and all that you know and, and having sort of energy on the page and all that but you know absolutely what's going on in every single panel so um well, i think i think it's, it, this is what it is a good advert for um uh, uh uh, the collectivism, the um, uh, collaboration, uh, yeah. because I mean, uh, I, I kind of thought a while back, you know, oh, let's write my own stuff, and and I failed dismally, <laughs> and and realised, you know, it takes uh, more than one head just to come together, sort of like to actually get the job done properly, you know, because two, in this case, three heads coming together, sort of like is is creating something, yeah. Makes us yeah. sound like a freak, a freakish. It creature. does, yeah. I, I was thinking a chimera. Yeah, if, yeah. if you will. 
Because <laughs> um, it, 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 it's it's a common complaint, particularly in American comics, that artists have where we're like, well, we we just get the scripts, and we mm -hmm. don't talk to the the writers at all, and we we draw it and then we hand it back, and the editor is the intermediary. Yeah, I, 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 it, I, that production line doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't thrill me at all. Really, I, I, I like this method of, yeah, back and forth, and and I, I, and uh, you know the idea that I'm doing the script, getting the art done, and then uh, they read it, have a look, and and then come back with another script. It's <laughs> that's great. I love it. They probably know where the story's going, obviously, but like um, you'd hope so. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> really? And any anybody anybody who um uh who listened to my interview with you, Henry, from a few years ago. Yeah, sorry uh, about that. Rambling. Well, 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 Rambled a lot. Well, no, 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 no. It was great. But uh the way you described the way you work or the way you had worked in the past. Oh. I, th I think I, th I think that that brought an all, awful lot of people out in a cold sweat with <laughs> there's so, yeah. many, so many layers to it. Um, I, I, how how are you producing pages now? Because you know you, you, we're talking about the amount of detail in these pages, the well, amount of before, work, the amount of coloring work. What, what's your process now? Yeah, I, I mean, before it was it was like um, I, I would only read one page at a time and then draw that page and then read the next page and see what happened. You know, that would keep my interest up, but. No, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> make too many mistakes. You know, I, I turn the page over and realise that, you, you know, there's something completely different to what I thought was going on is going on. So what I'm doing now is just reading the entire uh, six-page script and then uh, and, and doing that. But I don't know what's coming next week. That's that's the mystery. But that keeps it alive because I, I am exactly in the same position as the reader. I don't know what's going on. It's going to happen. So uh, when I get I mean, back... We... We do have a magical document called an outline. If you ever get super uh, curious, but that might spoil the uh, the surprises. Yeah, yeah, because there's some amazing surprises in this story, and I've just gone. I've been reading the script, and oh my god, no! <laughs> Literally, I've got my head in my hands. Going, what the? It's, it's yeah. So no spoilers, obviously. I well, one thing that really strikes me about this story is is, is dread is is still a fairly minor character in this he's very much in the back you know this is maitland's story dread is there he's doing his investigation against uh, uh major domo and and um uh you know he's there but he's not he's not the focus um i guess this is more of a question for henry it is uh, is it sometimes difficult to 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 push him into the background to make sure he's not constantly right in your face um it hasn't been too difficult because uh, uh, I, I, I think he's taking such a background uh, in this story that, that um, uh, yeah, the, the, I, I think Sanchez is, is is an interesting character as well. I, I, um, he, he's the, uh, the, the 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 guy on the Council of Five. Yeah, yeah, in, Hernan Hernandez. Sorry, Hernandez. Hernandez. Sorry, 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 Hernandez. Yeah, because he, he's a lot more, um, gets a lot more uh, screen time, as it were, than Dread. So, so Dread is, is is in the background a lot, although he, uh, uh, his presence is is felt when it when it is is there. But um, there yeah. is a kind of there is a kind of unwritten rule. I think Arthur and I talked about it a lot. We we we're, we are aware we have to have Dread. Mm in every episode doing something because it is fundamentally the Judge Dredd story. So there were, I think there were a few conversations where we went, I haven't got Dredd doing much. He needs to, he needs to do something. Uh, is that fair? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, another thing about this story is because it's kind of got this sort of citywide roaming quality to it. Sometimes we quite often need like a, a viewpoint character out there in the city so having Dread available as a, a person who can pop up anywhere and observe anything is actually pretty useful from that point of view. And I think writing writing Judge Dread, there's a, a kind of writing style that's the sort of close second person that it uh it drifts into quite easily. I think I think starting with Wagner, there's a sort of a panel 
a caption style that's like he did a thing and then he knew this thing was this other thing and then the he of that is usually dread um but it's never really quite nailed down every time um so having that kind of captioning following dread around is is very good for your sort of whole citywide overview and just taking in the whole scope of the thing uh and i think it it kind of grounds it and it sort of remains his story even 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 when he doesn't have to be on panel all the time for that 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 kind of third person narration um I find fascinating and 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 very uh, and not ne- not unique to dread, but but the persistence of it is is unique to dread. Um, I, I, and I don't know what the the official di- is third person participle, or whatever it is, where where the narration is referring to dread in the third person, but it is describing dread's thoughts. Mm. And and what you know, Wagner's done this plenty of times, and he, it, I mean, it, Rob, especially you, it, it seems to be a favorite of yours is is this the influence of kind of like um uh, noir and westerns and things like that where where i think i think it probably is i think it's like raymond chandler-esque isn't it Mm. basically and and sort of you know and 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 that's kind of dread is that kind of character um but um but it's i mean it's you know it's what it's kind of wagner's kind of voice and so when you when you write that you kind of it's almost like as a writer it's your way into writing dread almost you kind of go okay because because it feels right when you do it, and the reason it feels right is because John did it for so long and did it did it so well. So mm. it just it feels like a tonal calling card, basically. You kind of go, yeah. right, okay, we're in we're in Dread's world now, and we're we're seeing thing this scene through Dread's eyes. But I mean, whoever that narrator is, no one, you know, that's kind of <laughs> it's kind of an interesting question. But um, but that narrator obviously some sometimes, and, and this is the way John always wrote it, has a kind of ironic kind of like take on on the hard oh, yeah. man, sort of like um uh, the hard man you know leading character genre as as, as well at times you know it's 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 I a like really the, it's a little uh, cool to play with yeah i like the early stories in particular where sometimes it'll just get really cruel <laughs> just really invested in the horrible fates of whoever it's uh it's looking at yeah yeah uh, Someone's wandering out into the cursed earth and getting eaten by by scorpions or falling in a rad pit, and it'll just get really lurid. <laughs> but it's, I mean, but also, I mean, that's like, I think with this story, like a better world, it does. It, it, it in in a way, we're pushing the dread sort of world a little, but um, it's very in keeping, you know. I think like just the things that happens to Andy Ziet and stuff is a there's a nasty sense of humor about it um, at, at various points. I think. And I think there's a there's a sort of detached sort of comedy aspect to the citizens all ripping themselves to shreds at times as well, which is um, you know it's it's got that wry kind of sense of humour at times as well. I hope. Well, one of the things I I, I do want to ask about, um, and obviously we're, we're, uh, in the real world at the point that this is going out, we're only up to episode seven out of was it nine or ten episodes? No, nine. Nine. Okay. The, the panicked look on Rob's face just there as I asked him, how much have you written? Is it 10? No, I think it was not. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah right. um, so, Henry, did you finish the 10th episode? <laughs> <laughs> did you get the script? <laughs> um, uh, uh, so we, 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 we're coming up to the conclusion of, of, of A Better World. So, so no spoilers. But one of the things that, that uh, you know, we, we've we've all remarked on um on this podcast in the in, in the past is the um the notion of time uh, in dread's world and the notion of consequences in dread's world and this feels like a story that has consequences or will have consequences or has the potential to have consequences so i i i'm um, not giving anything away about the ending um do you see there being a, you know long-term consequences to this to to Maitland's experiment to to the nature of the judges and um the makeup of Mega City One. It's very difficult to answer with spoilers. 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 Um yeah. I mean yes. I don't know what they are yet. <laughs> I haven't written them. <laughs> we had a Arthur and I had a, a and Matt Smith the editor there was a little email back chain back and forth. 
about a week ago where some of the consequences were discussed but whether or not we go down that road so there is there there is um there is talk of, of um because I, I do think, just basically, without giving any spoilers away, I think if we just put a lid on on, on this and went, oh, well, it was one story. I, I, that no, would, more. Un, that, would mean unsa- that, would, that would be unsatisfying to me, put it that way, anyway, I think. Mm-hmm. I think you've, you've, let, you've let the cat out of the bag a bit uh, uh, and you just kind of go, right, how do, you, how do you put it back in? And I think, even, you know, so there's going to be, there's drama there to me and um anyway and, and and when you see the ending i think you'll realize that i can't what, what can i say about the ending when you see it when yeah. they just there should when be dread holds hands with the protesters and stings the international it's it's it brings a tear to my eye it's bold it was bold yeah it was a People choice won't be expecting it <laughs> yeah um it's a type of thing. Um, like, I mean, when I did the um, when I did the uh, the uh, closet dread story years ago, when someone on Facebook I remember went, "I'm going to buy this comic just to burn it." That's the reaction we want from the end of, of this. Story. <laughs> well, be, because Arthur can't stop himself going on YouTube to uh, listen to reviews of his comics. You know, we'll find out that way. Oh, okay. Uh, um, okay. Here is the thing about the angry YouTuber. Uh, they are responding to an article in response to an article about the comic. I am pretty sure they have never read the actual comic ever. Of course not. Of course Somehow not. this has tens of thousands of views versus like some quite nice stuff by people who actually read it and engaged with it, which, you know, you can ask Google why that is. But um, yeah. I, I think people who are actually engaging with it are probably going to have a different experience than people who are sort of hearing about it at a far and, and having a uh, a little rant in their corner. I mean, like, like you say, I, I, uh, the fact that you've got a figure like that in the comic, you know, basically what, yeah. what, what, what if Kingpin was Alex Jones, you know, kind of thing. It's, uh, it, it's quite on the nose, that aspect. Oh, don't call him Kingpin. <laughs> Wait, did I just give a spoiler? We we did get no, but uh, <laughs> it's funny. There's like a whole sequence uh, where we we sort of said this is kind of like a, a uh, Bill Sankiewicz uh, sequence, and I don't think that went into the the script at all. But then when we got back, it was kind of like a, a, a Bill Sankiewicz. Kingpin in his office looking over his uh, vast crime domain scene. So I think the the intent got through. <laughs> yeah, that might have been my fault rather than the writers. <laughs> yeah, that's probably an artistic judgment. I mean, he works great. He's got great design. Hmm. But so, also, going back to the consequences thing, well, when when is Dred's 50th birthday? Um, uh, well, uh, 2027. Right, three years. All right, so that's fine. We'll just shut down Mega City One in three years. Or shut, or shut down two thousand AD at this rate. That'll be good. <laughs> hey, if anyone's going to destroy two thousand AD, it's me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're, and you're well on the way to doing so. <laughs> uh, I heard a thing from uh, John Wagner. He, he basically said uh, years and years ago. Now we might have updated it all, uh, but in, in a pub. Um, uh, there was this conversation he had about the idea that Judge Dredd was going to remain the same age throughout. The, the year was going to change, but it's going to be a bit, bit like Batman. So Batman will never age. So like Judge Dredd will never age, but the year will keep ticking by, but he will still say, still say, be the same age, you know. And he and he will keep complaining about his uh, old bones throughout. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so just keep on going, and you know we just have to accept that that's that's the reality of of how it's written. <laughs> With, um, so, uh, in terms of the um, if 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 somebody has read or intends to read um, uh, a better world, you don't necessarily uh, I I don't think have to have read the stories that came before it, but. Um, uh, just just run through the you know if, if somebody wants to get all the 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 kind of backstory uh, behind this, what are the stories that people need to read? Because um, 
You've you've already was... mentioned um some of them, he said, completely forgetting the uh there was carry carry the nine, yeah. Um which ran in the internet hopefully will inform me. Um hmm. collected in end of days. Oh, there oh, we go. Yeah. Were... Um yeah, buy that and then I get rolled these. That's good. Um mm. and then what else was there? Um there there's was... uh, the hard way collected in Regicide. And the pitch was the one where um Maitland went um uh, before the council um to sort of suggest this experiment, and that was in prog two three zero two. I'm not sure where that's been collected, if it has been collected. That hasn't been collected yet. So, mm -hmm. so um, Judge Dredd, End of Days, uh, Judge Dredd, Regicide, uh, and then, um, what was it, 2302? Two. Uh, but I do believe that there's going to be a collection of, um, uh, of A Better World. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, I think, I think if you add up the pitch, the Hagger They Fall, and this... I think it'd be a it would be a decent sized volume, a little slim. I don't know if that would need another story, but uh well, the, I think it gets uh, us uh, most of the way. Uh, droids are working on uh, on that as we speak. Um so uh, <laughs> soon. Um so this uh this episode um is the relaunch of the 2080 Thrillcast after <clears throat> a bit of a gap where um all my diodes burnt out, and I had to do other things. Um, but uh, uh, we've uh, earlier in the episode, we've got um, some comics critics uh, talking about the best way to get into 2008, the way they got into 2008. Um, if, uh, as as you know, esteemed Judge Dread uh, creators yourselves, um, if there was one volume of Dread. Out there that that uh, that you would recommend to somebody who says, well, "I want to get into Judge Dead." What what's what's the one that you would you would always recommend, Rob? Um, well, it's it's Case Files Five, isn't it? Um, because Case Files Five has got um, a Judge Death Lives and Block Mania and the Apocalypse War. Am I right? Tell me if I'm wrong. Because yeah, tend... well, it's got it's got the four dark judges in it, uh, and then Block War and. Um... And and yeah, apocalypse war, right? Apocalypse war, yeah. yeah. Block so yeah Why that, do I always call it block war? The, the, literally, on the first episode of this podcast in like 2015, I went through the entire thing calling it block war as opposed to block mania. It's block mania. So yeah. you've got the dark judges, block mania, and um, the apocalypse war. There we go. Yeah, but well, you can't you can't really go wrong there. Yeah. Um, I did actually weirdly. I bought Pierce Files Nine a while back, and I was reading that, and that is just like everyone a banger. Basically, it's not got the same level of, um, you know, the same most famous dread stories like the Dark Judges and, and things like yeah. that. But you know, everyone involved on Case Falls Nine, he said, looking at this, um, is um, yeah, that they they just like Wagner and Grant are just absolutely rolling at that point. So I would I would recommend that. And then I would obviously say they should buy uh, Judge Dread the Small House by myself and Mr. <laughs> Henry Flint. Because um, it's very good, and then we get peanuts of bunny. Do we peanuts? Do we get peanuts? Yeah, peanuts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good. But it's good as well. And if you like a better world, then that's me and Henry on on a different dread story. Yeah, oh, what, what's I just say buy those ones. <laughs> uh, five's probably probably my go to answer most of the time. Honestly, when I'm, I'm asked this, um, I mean, if we're sort of supposed to throw in a sort of sideways pitch for ourselves and Henry on a story. I I'm I'm still very fond of the sort of movie tie-in ones that I, I did with uh Henry. So uh those are definitely worth looking at if you want to get in via the movie verse, there's your your way. Um in terms of the classics, I I'd go five, then maybe two for like the cursed earth. That is still pretty amazing as Judge Dredd's Basically, solidification of a, a universe going on right there. Um, I think in terms of modern stuff, and this is a bit of a this is a bit of a tough ask because it's multi volumes. But there is a, a stretch between Origins and really right the way up to Trifecta. 
so like Origins, Tour of Judy, Day of Chaos. That is like the strongest the comic has ever been. It's really quite an amazing stretch. So I'd, I'd probably try and steer people into that and, you know, really let them see, I'm going to call it modern dread. I think that's a sort of range starting around 2000 and something, which calling that modern maybe shows my age, but, uh, you know, really dread at its height rather than the sort of origin stuff and still going strong. Henry, what, what about you? Um, yeah, I, I was going to go for um, uh, Cursed Earth as well. Uh, and because uh, uh, of Mike of McMahon's uh, put so much energy in it's, it's one of his most quickest energetic styles that he had. And uh, uh, it's beautiful to just look at that artwork. I lo love that. Uh, also, uh, I, I, I have to mention um, uh, Atlantis by mm -hmm. uh, that was Wagner and um, McCarthy, was it? I think, uh, and that is a weird one because it's it's kind of like beautifully told story with um, uh, characterization and sort of expressions all the way through. It's lovely, beautiful, and um, but it's not a, exactly a volume. It's that's a specific story within the volume. So yeah. Well, that, that, that's the beauty of the case, yeah. world, is, you, you, you know, you go in for one story and then you get all these other stories as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, I, I'll draw that to close. Thank you so much for chatting about A Better World. Um, it, it, uh, it, not to blow smoke up your backside, but it is fantastic. Um, and very, I, I, I do know what the conclusion is um, because it was spoiled for me by one Mr. Rob Williams. So thanks for that. When did uh, I do that? Weeks ago. I mean, <laughs> to, to be fair, I did ask you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh... Was I drunk? Probably. I mean, yeah. what are you not? You always drunk. <laughs> Good point. Well made. If I only had the memory, I'd know when when it was. The fact that I can't remember telling you is a worrying sign. I think it was in a pub in London. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Then. yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, fantastic work. We're really looking forward to seeing people's reaction to the end of it. And thank you for sharing uh, a little bit of uh, uh, the behind the scenes inside track on uh, on its creation. So uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, to more from our own trifecta of creators. See what you did there. Nice. Good. Does that make me the owl? <laughs> the owl. Bring I, out I, the owl. I need way more hair. <laughs> Bye.